Hello guys, welcome to the first episode of Galley Stories, Stories of the Bering Sea and Beyond. I am and will be your host, Mark Kaler. This is going to be an ongoing, ever-changing, and ever-evolving series, all based upon the fishing industry and those who choose to make a life doing so. And because this is going to be the first one, I thought that I should invite a good friend of mine, Captain Jack Molin, who is a published author and currently working on his second book. I've asked him to come and help me introduce the series and to really kick it off. Jack, how are you today? Doing good, Mark. Thanks. Awesome place here you got here. (laughs) Everything's recorded on the boat. All interviews are done here. And you'll notice over the time of the series, guys, that some of them are going to seem a little newer. Some of them are going to seem a little older. And that's because we've already recorded several of these. We've progressed and gotten better at doing them. So uh, some of the first ones might seem like they're not as well orchestrated. But these are all unfiltered. I do try to say unedited, but my better half has been trying to take the ums and ins out. So at any rate, Jack, welcome. Yeah, thank you. So let's, let's just dive right into it. Let's get some history. Okay, well, a lot of times people will ask me, uh, how, how in the world did you get started in the fishing business? And in reality, I didn't have any family connections to fishing. I didn't have any, any thought I'd ever be a fisherman. I kind of grew up in a leave it to beaver sort of a home. You know, a stable mom and dad and two sisters. Spent a lot of time in Bend, Oregon growing up as a kid. It was like an idyllic, perfect place to grow up. The biggest schism came for me, in, I, and I remember this date, believe it or not, it was 1968 because I was out mowing the lawn, and my dad came out and said, hey, come in here and watch these crazy surfers. I went in, and what I saw on the TV blew my mind. These guys, it was a 1968 World Contest in Puerto Rico, and I was fascinated. I couldn't get enough of it. And I remember my mom saying, oh, honey, the waves are getting big. It's really dangerous. And I remember thinking oh, now it's getting good. I wish I was there, you know, sort of thing. So I was hooked. I was totally, it's really unusual, I think, for a kid to get hooked on something when they're 12 or 13 years old, but I had found my direction. Were you already surfing then, or this no. was just the first time you saw it on the TV? Never been on, never been at the ocean. I lived, uh, at the time, we lived in West Seattle, and I was riding a skimboard on, <laughs> on Elkai Point, but I had it in my head that that's what I was going to go do. So uh, it actually uh, focused me pretty heavy, but the day after high school, I graduated down in Tacoma. Uh, the day after high school, I moved to Seaside, Oregon. And uh, from there on, I just went there to go surfing. And I didn't really give much thought to how I would survive or live. I always knew I had to work. That was all I had to do. If I, if I had time to surf, I was a success. So believe it or not, I became a dishwasher I'm in Seaside, Oregon. But I became a pretty special dishwasher, I think, because the owner of the place really needed a guy during the day. I went in and talked to him. This is kind of a short story. I went in and talked to him. I said, well, I'd love to be your dishwasher. I'll be the best one you've ever had. But uh, I need to surf, man. So he said, okay, just call in. If you're going to miss breakfast, call in and be here before noon to get the dishes done up for noon. So I would come roaring in there in my Volkswagen bus. He's still in my wetsuit. The dishes stacked everywhere, and the waitress is screaming at me. And I'd just laugh and get it all cleaned up real fast, get it done for lunch, and then I'd go back surfing in the afternoon. So... That was my career. That was all I cared about at the time. Not not a bad gig if you can get it. (laughs) (laughs) It was pretty carefree, I'll tell you. So, anyway, I eventually uh, spent my winters in Mexico and Hawaii. I got hooked up with some really high-performance professional surfers. And even now, as I look back on it, I was being trained to be in uh, critical situations because they were taking me out in waves I probably shouldn't have gone in. My skills weren't that good yet. But I didn't care. I didn't want to be let down or let those guys down. And I learned some things about working with fear and, and working with my and keeping my courage up when, when it really didn't look all that great. The waves were enormous over there. It was awesome. Moving back to Seaside, I went to work at a cannery. Once again, Nefco, Nef, Nefco Seafoods in Warrington. The reason I did it, of course, was the good hours. It was a swing shift, so I could still surf. I'd go to work at 2 or 3 in the afternoon and work till midnight. What were they processing? They did a little bit of everything. They did tuna. They did crab. I'd have to bring out a bunch of frozen tuna at night and thaw it out. And it was a mess. It was an old-style cannery. Down there, like, probably Dungeness crab. A lot of dungy crab, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And so, uh, you know, I'd work a lot of overtime and, and try to save up some money. I never was a surf bum. I just I wanted to. I needed some time to go wide waves. That was like, if I didn't have that, I would have been a complete failure. I talked to a fisherman one day, and he said he just made, I don't know, 1000 or 1200 bucks that week. And I about fell over. 
This is now, this is 1975 or 76. This is a while ago. Put, put that in context. What were you making uh, at the cannery? Well, I worked overtime a lot, and I was making about 250 a week, you know. I was working six, seven days a week. So 1000 1200 bucks. Yeah. So, you know, between big drags on his cigarette, this guy's going, yeah, this is cool, man. I'm making big bucks, you know. I thought, oh, that's for me. i got to be a fisherman. That, that's just what I'm going to do, you know. Because then when he told me, I said, well, what do you do in the winter? He goes, well, the married guys go dungeon fishing, but he says, I just go to Mexico. And I just, the light bulb came on, man. Oh, my God, that's it. Perfect, you know. So, anyway, I uh, kicked around there for a while, and a boat pulled in called the Tiffany. You probably don't know that boat. That boat was retired in the 80s sometime. Any fishermen listening to this will be nodding their heads. The Tiffany was a 1922 buoy tender that was one of the original crab boats, king wood, crab boats. Wood. I think it was steel. I think oh. it was a. I think it was a uh, riveted hull. And the the gentleman driving it, and I say gentleman kindly because he was an amazingly kind guy, Clifford Hall, from the Hall family in Newport, Oregon. They pulled in to pick up some dungy pots. And when I found out that was a king crab boat, I freaked out. I said, I got to go. I got to go. So I ran to my boss. I said, these guys need help loading pots. And then I'm going to ride with them down to Newport. And he says, well, are you quitting or are you coming back? I said, well, I'll let you know in a few days. Because <laughs> I didn't know, you know. So I did. I helped him load some dungy pots. And I jumped on board. And I got talking to the crew. And I was all friendly. And everything was just, oh, man, I was happy. And. We went out across the bar, and Clifford fired up a big cigar, and I got so seasick. Oh, my God. And I didn't want him to know, you know, and it was just like I couldn't, I, I just couldn't stay off the rail. It was just horrid. So the following day, Clifford talked to me, and he encouraged me that if I wanted to be a crab fisherman, I should stay in Newport and build the pots. So I went to the pot shop, checked it out, and for Seattle guys, now that I know a, a few things from what I didn't know then, they were rubber wrapping those pots down there for the guys like uh, the progress or excuse me the provider and some of those boats and i thought to myself no this is no good i want to go crab fishing i don't want to stay here and build gear how long did you do that well i started really hitting the docks then for a job i said well clifford said you need to get some experience so i thought well okay i'll go shrimping there's a shrimp fleet there shrimping was pretty hot back then the mid-70s i went up and down the dock quite a bit anytime i wasn't working banging on boats and um, I learned real fast that good boats don't need help they have good help mm -hmm. and they're happy and bad boats always need help and you don't want to go on bad boats you may not come back alive so I had a guy train me up on that he said kid I know you want to work hard but he says don't go on that boat you know it just goes through people and guys get hurt and so by a super fortunate stroke of luck I started talking to a guy in the dock right next to a brand new boat. This boat was two months old. He had a Volkswagen bus like I did, so we started talking buses. And before you know it, I find out that this boat's two months old. You know, it's brand new and it's beautiful, and they let me on, showed me around. Well, it was the Pegasus of all boats. And Pegasus was in my fishing career the rest of my life almost, on and off. It's just a, a real interesting twist of fate. But first I went over to get ice. This is funny. They're going, hey, we got to go get ice. Do you want to go? I'm going, yeah. I'm in my shorts and, and slaps. And so I jumped down in the fish hole with this big hose, and I'm putting ice in the fish hole. And I don't know what, I don't know anything about what I'm doing, right? But I'm just slinging ice. Well, I got up to my waist in ice, and by the time I got myself out of the ice, I didn't have any thongs left, you know. They were gone at the bottom <laughs> of the ice. And the guys laughed. They thought that was so funny. And I, I could care less. I wrote my name on a matchbook, you know. Here's my phone number. I know you guys will never need anybody, but if you do, blah, blah, blah. Well, lo and behold, about midnight that night, I get a phone call from the owner of the boat. And he said, my son was the captain. He got hurt. I fired one guy. The other guy you met, he quit. So I need a crew. He says, do you know how to shrimp? And I had to tell him, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> of course I do. Yeah. I've been on a lot of shrimp boats. Oh, well, yeah. yeah, I'd been unloading a lot of shrimp boats. So, okay, I'll uh, be here at 3 in the morning, you know. So, oh, my gosh. So I went down there, and I got hired, and he figured out I was totally green, but he liked me because I was, I was really, uh, what do you call me, ambitious. He said, it's nice to see an ambitious kid. 
long story short, I was in the Pegasus for a while, and oh, and I did find my thongs at the end of that trip at the bottom of the ice pit. <laughs> <laughs> Four or five days later, kind of a funny deal. And then he owned another boat called Cape Lookout. So I worked between those two boats. I worked for about a year and a half or two years. But to be honest with you, I really didn't like it. Just doing shrimp? Yeah, I didn't like shrimping. I didn't like... It's murder on your hands. Explain the process a little bit to us, would you? Well, there's, there's, there's called twin rig, which is two, two nets go out, one on each side. And they tickle the bottom and kick the shrimp up. And then you bring it back up after an hour, two or three, or however good the shrimping is. And then it all... Back then, it all went into a big bin. You had to tilt the bin up and pull out all the fish. Well, in the process of sweeping your hands through the fish, I don't know if they have better gloves now or what, but your hands, is, it's like porcupines, was poisonous. Your hands are just puffed up and hurting all summer. I, I just didn't like, I don't know, there was a few things I didn't like about fishing in Oregon. Uh, the, the, the Columbia Bar, I didn't like. I really didn't like just coming home. I learned that uh, I prefer to go for a couple months and be gone, yeah. away from home, and then come back and just so enjoy. So you're going home. home every night then? Yeah, every two or three days. Dungeness was that way, or in and out. So it just it just didn't fit what I like to do. So, were you still fitting into my surfing? Oh, well, I was surfing big time back then. Yeah, that would be seventy seven, seventy eight. I think I just met my future wife. Then a guy shows up. This is another one of those big moments, and you don't even know it. You know, when you have these big moments in your life, this guy shows up at Seaside in the surf parking lot with this sixty eight. Chevy Impala, and he's got about six or eight boards on top, just rainbow-colored, beautiful boards from Hawaii. I'm looking at these things going, oh, my God, that's an, an amazing assortment of boards, you know, and I know who made the boards. They're, like, from a professional guy. So we got to talking, and he said, oh, yeah, my name's David Copra. You know, I, I'm going to be leaving for France next week, and then I'm going to spend a month in France, and then i got to go back to the Bering Sea and go fishing. So we got talking around the campfire, and we ended up talking late into the night, in our wetsuits around the campfire and he filled my head with stories man this was like 78 this was the boom year boom years of king Crabbit. at the time he was on the royal viking you know he's telling stories about busting windows out rolling boats over icing up you know guys getting beat up and dead and but he goes but it's big bucks man if you can survive you can make really big bucks you know and that's why i'm going to france for a month because I, I can afford it and i'm just going oh baby sign me up i gotta go i gotta go you got visions of surfboard oh, in your head right <laughs> i was so stoked it was like time and money i guess i should explain my theory or my my belief on time and money you gotta have time you gotta have money okay you know people that have lots of time but they don't have any money that's no good and then you know people that have lots of money, but they don't have any time. So I think they're just as broke as the other people. They're just, they, you know, they, they think they they think someday they're going to make time. Well, I hope they don't have a heart attack before them. I don't mean to to, uh, to diss anybody about that. So fishing looked like time and money. I can go work for six months. And, it, and I was also fired up. I was totally fired up to see if I could do it. Money I was never a really big concern for me. If I have enough money to live on, I seem like I was happy. But could I hack it? Could I do what those guys were doing? Because they were talking about working 60, 70 hours, just endless amount of crab coming. So David laughed, and he said, well, you better start driving up to Seattle, look for a job. Go up to a place called Ballard. Going, oh, okay, I'll go to Ballard. And he took off for France. So I drove up. And I got to South Seattle. I'm in a 1966 split window Volkswagen bus, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, with surfboards on top. Now that I think about it, it's just hilarious. But I pulled into Des Moines or somewhere down there on the south end of town. And I was getting gas, and I asked the guy, I said, Hey, where's the Ballard exit off of I-5? He says, Ha, 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 you're not from around here, are you? I said, Well, no. I said, from Oregon. He goes, there ain't no Ballard exit. He goes, you can't get there from here. <laughs> I'm going, oh, you got to be kidding me. I thought there was a place called Ballard. He goes, there is. There just ain't no way to get there. So I drove up a little farther and asked another guy, and he directed me up in here. And I knew when I hit it. The boats were at the docks. Fisherman's Terminal? Fisherman's Terminal, right here where we're sitting, man. Look at that. We're looking right across the street. If this was 1978... That'd be 40 years ago, right? Mm -hmm. Isn't it? Oh, my gosh. So here we are sitting here like gray-headed guys talking about the old times. <laughs> anyway, it was no problem parking anywhere and sleeping in the bus. And I just started hitting the boats, and nobody would talk to me. Nobody would. 
I mean, there was a friggin' boom going on. Boats were being built, boats were being commissioned. Crews were very tight-lipped about any, any other work that was available. They were all getting their friends hired. So I tried a few times, up and back, up and back. And then David came back. I went back to work on the shrimp boats, and I was pretty disappointed. I thought, oh, man, I should just be able to slide right up there and get a job, you know. David Coper came back from a season, and he goes, hey, you want to see my new house? And I'm thinking, yeah, right, where's that at? Well, he bought a house on top, probably the best surf spot on the West Coast, and five acres. And he goes, yeah, I got to go to work here in a few days uh, on the Bering Sea. I got a job on the Bering Sea. It's going to take me a couple years to pay this off. I'm going, holy crap, man, I really want to do this. How do I get on? How do I get on? He goes, oh, come on up and do some gear work with us, you know. He was such a friendly guy. He was a very infectious sort of a friendly guy. Was he your age or? High energy. He was probably five years older than me. Mm -hmm. Just a really uh, focused, energized sort of guy. Anyway, I came up and I got on the Bering Sea and we were doing, and I don't know if you know, but back then in the late 70s, the Bering Sea was like, it was better than UPS. I mean, they delivered the crab without fail. They were the top boat. And then they how, how big was the Bering Sea? Bering Sea is about 100, and, I want to guess, 115 maybe. And then they built the Arctic Sea and the North Sea later, the 123s. Chris Paulson, the Danish guys, they were phenomenal professionals. Their gear was just... And, of course, I didn't know any of this at the time. I mean, I knew that they paid well and it was a really clean boat and all that, but I didn't really know the difference. Um, doing gear work, painting buoys, that sort of thing. I think it was Chris Paulson came down to the boat with an envelope started handing out checks for last king crab season and nobody was showing me their checks you know except this one kid and he was like the new kid for seven weeks he got a hundred and five thousand okay? dollars oh lord yeah now this is 1978 mm -hmm. okay you could buy a house in ballard for about 35 grand i think maybe 50 if it was a really nice house right i looked at that and went this is insane. I'm going to go for free. I don't care. I'm going, you know. I don't care what it takes. I just want to go. I want to go. I want to be able to do this, you know. And the kid was pretty happy. Of course, he went right out and bought a Corvette and a condo. And I think he ended up foreclosing on his condo because he got in trouble with taxes. But anyway, that's a whole other story. That's a fisherman's life. But there was a lot of money handed out. And, you know, I think there was a disservice done to a lot of guys by handing them that much money. They're like professional athletes that people take advantage of them mm -hmm. you know it's fast and loose because you don't have to pay taxes till next year a lot of people don't understand that i don't want to get off track but it's like fishing and farming you don't have to pay estimates or anything till the following year so man if it's 15 months away till you pay taxes let's have a good time so a lot of guys got in trouble i'd say at least half the guys i ever worked with got in trouble for taxes Let's get back on you. Yeah, so, here we go. I never got in trouble with taxes. I just, pay, I just paid big taxes. So did you get on the Bering Sea then? No, I did not. I was jazzed. I couldn't get on it. They sent me over to the American Number 1 right there. It was being built. And it was massive. It was Marco? a Mar Marco boat. Mm -hmm. Marco was flying through the boats, building boats back then. And they kind of ran me around and said, no, no, don't do that. You know. So I finally gave up and went back home finished up a shrimp season there I think and then um, I started going up to the tugboats I got an in on tugboats and it was two weeks on two weeks off I said okay let's do that so I I would go every Wednesday I would drive up go through the tugboat dispatchers nope don't don't get anything for you don't get anything for you finally one day this guy says well hunting season's coming up so usually I have to hire a couple of guys so the other guys can take time off and I said well I really need to know I said I don't want to be pushy but I really need to know because if you don't hire me I'm going to drive up to Seattle right now and try to get on a king crab boat. And he said, kid, don't stay here one more minute. Just get your ass out of here. Get up there and get on a crab boat. He says, look at these tugboat guys. He goes, look at us. We're only 50 years old. I'm thinking 50. That's really old, you know. Mm -hmm. But we're in bad shape and blah, blah, blah. So he says, I would never work on a tugboat if I could get on a king crab boat. So I made one, one more trip up here. After all those trips, nothing ever happened. And while I was gone that trip, I'm going to try to explain this. It's like this thing of fate. My best buddies, we were like a core group of three or four surfer guys. They were surfing together, and one of my buddies got bit by a shark while I was in Seattle. And it was a horrible bite. It was the first shark bite on the West Coast that anybody could remember in cold water. He was laid open from his butt cheeks up to his shoulder. His rib cage was broke. Everything was just shredded. 
I got home and felt bad. The guy lived. I felt real bad. He was a friend of ours. So I knew that the same David Coper guy was friends with a filmmaker in Hawaii. I know it's a little bit off, but I called David Coper's mom and said, this is Jack. I want to get a hold of David. I want to get a film from Hawaii so we can raise some money for this guy. Right? You follow me? Mm -hmm. Is that clear enough? Okay. So about two weeks later, David calls me. And he says, hey, how you doing? Oh, man, good. Do, do you think we can get a film, blah, blah, blah? And he just let me talk and talk. And finally he said, well, yeah, we'll get you a film. But he says, that's not why I'm calling. I said, oh, what's up? He goes, well, you said you wanted to go king crabbing. I said, yeah, I do. And he goes, well, he says, well, um, they're building a brand new boat at Marco. And they just gave it to me. And I'm putting a crew together. And I got a spot for a half share greenhorn guy. He says, do you want a, a day or two to think about it? I said, no, I just thought about it. I'll go. <laughs> so sure enough, I was in. We came up here. That would have been in the, the late fall of 79. What was the name of that boat? The Columbia, believe it or not. And back then... So the, you're saying it was home. The Columbia was yeah. green. Yeah. And when I got here, he took us down to see the boat. The boat was half built. They just rolled it over. They built it upside down. They rolled the hull over. They're putting engines in it. They're putting tank piping. I mean, it was just you know mega shipyard stuff going on. The house and the mast were over on this side of the canal, uh, opposite of Marco, because the they, side. they were running out of space. Mm -hmm. There was at least six or eight brand new boats lined up in various stages of completion. And I'll, I'll never. I should have took pictures back then, of course. But it was like Star Wars, Starbound, Golden Dawn. I remember there was two white boats there. I think they were 108s. And then Seawolf pulls in with his million dollar paint job, and I just thought I died and gone to heaven, man. These boats were the, they were the bad to the bone. I mean, God, they were nice boats. Some of those boats still are bad to the bone. They all are. You yeah. know, all those 123s, there's not a single one that, they had one that sank, the Arctic Wind, he sank, but they brought him back up. So anyway, I was in. We had to build 500 crab pots. We got it all done. They, I was learning in leaps and bounds how to build gear how to think right these guys every single guy from this boat from on the columbia at that time every single guy except myself came from the sea boats and when i say that the guys in the fishing industry will understand that the sea boats do things their own way they're very different very professional very picky very precise sort of guys they're super productive so we went up with 500 pots and back then for the listeners that don't understand the difference between then and now, back then it was an Olympic system. We had the gun would go off and the entire fleet would pounce on the crab and when the quota was caught, it was over. So it was a race. If you spent six hours at the dock that you didn't need to, you were losing. So we never, we never stopped. We never slowed down for anything. But the quota was also 100 million pounds in 1980. 79, 1980, the quota was 100 million pounds. We did seven full trips of king crab, so it was 1.4 million pounds just for our boat. What was your experience like when, when you, I mean, it was your first year crabbing. Yeah. I want to hear some stories about that first year. Were you scared? No, I was with really good guys. I never got uh, browbeat or I never got laughed at, and I'm a pretty athletic guy. I always have been, uh, just natural athlete, so I could hop around like a monkey. You know, I loved being up on the stack. I loved it when it was blowing hard and I was hanging on 30 feet above the water and I'm just looking over the side going, all I got to do is let go and I'm dead, man. And I just <laughs> laugh about it, you know. It's like, yeah, we're doing this. We're doing this, you know. But the, the hours was amazing because we would go out, try to get some rest on the way in, try to get some rest on the way out. We get on the gear and the way David put the gear into, into one place we never got a we got a five minute break in between strings. We just worked and worked and the thing was we'd fill the boat up. We'd fill the boat up in thirty or forty hours, so nobody wanted to sleep anyway. You know, it was like I was making like ten grand a trip or something and you know, I was holding up and I was learning as much as I could. I was learning how to navigate, learning how I never did learn how to cook. I didn't want to learn how I'd get kinda of seasick if I was in there cooking. On deck I'm trying to think. I can't think of anything that happened that was dangerous or that we almost biffed it or almost lost it. Or it's just a really well operated boat. The boat was the boat was super robust and it had lots of reserve. She still is. Still is. It's a, it's a classic. It's an amazing vessel. If it's operated well, you know, I've often said boats are kind of like horses. A bad driver can ruin a good horse. You know, 
but a good driver can take a, a limp horse home or whatever it takes. So that's just one of my millions of sayings. What was the colors on her when she came out? What it was green. Out? I'm not sure what color of green it was. Evergreen. It was awesome. It was kind of like you see green in the East Coast boats. And one of the owners, oh, this is something I should have brought up. There were seven owners at the time. Of course, now I'm a greenhorn. I don't know anybody. I don't know anything. I don't know who owns it. I don't know what's going on. But Chuck and Corey were two of the principal owners. Corey Ness and Chuck, of course, had started Trident, and they were big shots. And, of course, I didn't know that. But then uh, one of the owners was from the East Coast, and that's how it got the name and the, and the color green. It was a Cadillac. It stuck out because it was green, you know. We eventually built 700 pots. When you're going for those big quotas... How many were you stacking on deck at a time? We could put 220 on. I think we put 230 on one time just to finish up a season. But we could put 90 just on the flat deck. And um, then how many would you have in the water at a time? Did you, would you drop your 230 and then go back in? And Oh, yeah. We made three trips at the start yeah. of the season, get that gear out there. I'll never forget the first time we dropped gear. It was my first view of Alaska. We came around the corner. We crossed the Gulf in February. We're going to fish Baraday. We went up to Unimac Pass in the dark, up on the Tanner Grounds. We, uh, the sun came up, and those mountains, those cone-shaped mountains were pink, and the volcano was puffing, and I was on top of that stack unchaining things, and I thought, this is it, baby. Mm-hmm. We are there. I felt just like when I was at the North Shore of Hawaii or something. Like I was the epicenter of where I wanted to go at the time. So it was a great feeling. I got a lot of fond memories from back then. I really do. Well, you have to have a lot of fond memories of the Columbia, because when I met you, which was just you know not too many years ago, you were running the Columbia. So yeah. how did our progression go? It's crazy. I you know the reason I named my book. Did I tell you I wrote a book? You can get it on Amazon. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. It's you called. Can't, you you can't, can't make this stuff up, man. So I literally thought because I was a surf dog, I wasn't married yet or anything else. I thought all I got to do is make fifty. I got to clear fifty grand. I'm gonna move to Maui and live forever. I won't ever need to work again. I mean, I surf all the time. You know, that's how funny a young guy, that's how funny that is to think about that. Um, you just wanted enough money to, to be yeah. able to surf. Right, right. But we fished that first Baraday season back then, you know, 2 million pounds of Baraday at 50 cents a pound. And the king crab was a buck a pound. I mean, 100 million pounds is great, but it's a buck a pound. So from that first season, David Copra went on to gill netting. And I bring up his name a lot because he's a very influential guy on me. And his brothers. He had two brothers that worked on the boat, too. He went on to Gillnet, and he built the Moby Duck. I don't know if you've ever the seen Moby that The Moby Duck. Have you ever seen that? No. Okay, well, that's an amphibious gillnetter out of Iggy Gick. He He built that to take advantage of super low tides. And anybody from Bristol Bay knows Moby Duck. And half of them hate the guy, and half of them think he's awesome. But that's just what it is. He's a, he's a, a real trendsetter. So. You still friends with him? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we hear from David at least a year we get you know cards and everything else he lives he's lived over in hawaii for quite a while Mm -hmm. what happened on the columbia and to me after 1980 was the crab crashed king crab crashed big time 1981 we actually had a biologist for a captain then paul tate and he had a lot of explanations for it but it went from 100 million pounds down to i don't know what it was 10 million or something just a huge crash and it, it crashed as fast as it came up. A lot of guys say that crab didn't grow up there. It came from somewhere else. So for me, we went through a couple of different captains on the Columbia. And one of the things I learned from that is that every captain is like the ruler of a country. I mean, you control the entire culture of a boat. How your guys are going to treat each other, how you treat your crew, how they're going to dress, how they act in town kind of language they use how they treat the guys in the dock every single captain changed that boat so the boat itself wasn't it wasn't magic although i thought many times i've thought it was i've I've thought it's just got this really cool fishy thing about it but it really was the captain that set the pace so i went i stayed with the boat i'm going to bring this up this one i'm not proud of this moment in my life but this happened so fishing was horrible we went over to kodiak and we had a captain who's no longer alive now and most guys in the fishing fleet know who it was this guy was so bad he was so horrible and i was so appalled to his actions and his behavior 
that all we did was talk about the captain. We had six guys on board, and all we did was talk about the captain. We had all this turmoil. It was endless turmoil, constant stress. It was just nonstop. You know, I was on deck one day, and I said, I'm really tired of this. We're not making any money. This guy treats us like dogs. I said, I think I'm going to go home. They go, oh, yeah, great. That would be great, man. How are you going to do that? And I said, well, why don't we all just go home? So I was the instigator. And shortly, enough, within an hour, we all agreed to hang in there. And we pulled up on the next pot. And nobody threw the hook. We said, take us to town. He goes, you can't do this. We said, we just did it. You can't pull a pot without us. So we went into Kodiak. We all got airplane tickets and went home. He was sitting there with a the big, beautiful Columbia all by himself. Now, how many years were you on the Columbia at this point? <laughs> was, uh, I'm sorry for laughing because I didn't even know if I was going to bring that up. I, well, that's what we're after here, John. Yeah, we're I know. After... I was accused. I was devastated. I was totally blown away. That was my boat. That was my heart. This, and the way that guy treated the boat was just killing me. It really is a good illustration of what a captain can get away with 2,000 miles away from the owners. All they got to do is call up and go, yeah, everything's fine, you know. And a crew is freaking out. I said, nothing's going to happen if we don't do something, you guys. You know, I pulled this big desertion, is what I was accused of. Anyway, this was 1984, 1983, over in Kodiak. It was the str strangest thing to walk off that boat with my bag and see this guy sitting in the wheelhouse. He, he had no idea what to do. He had a big, beautiful boat and not a crew. You know, nobody will work for him, so... Um, it's a terrible thing. Nothing's ever going to happen. So I got home, and I'm, I'm devastated. I thought, I just blew it. I'll never work up there again. I'm had, you know. I called one of the owners, the manager, and he says, I don't want to talk to you right now. I need to find a crew. Sure enough, my friend David Copra, I called him. I said, David, I feel so bad. I, you know, we left the boat, and it's just hammered this boat, and he's just ruining it. And he, he goes, you got to write the owners. you got to write the owners, you know. Back when we had write, we had to write instead of call or you know, no cell email, phone. no and, emails, right, right. Yeah. So anyway, I wrote him this letter, two-page letter, and I listed exactly what I saw, and that I was engineer and blah 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 blah, and I don't know, nothing happened. I didn't hear anything, and about four weeks later, I got a call from the manager. He says, "Do you want to go back to work on the Columbia?" And I said, "Well, not with that guy there." He goes, "No, we're taking him off." You know, so I said, "Okay." So I went up and took him off and. We spent the summer before the boat got converted into a trawler. Now, if you can follow this, this would be 1984. So in 1984, I told that same manager, I said, I've been up here long enough. I want to see my wife and son. My son had been born. His name's Gus. He's about six months old. I've been up here a long time. I've been fighting that skipper. We had the abandoned ship, all this stuff. You know, I'm tired. He goes, no, you got to stay there in the engineer. I go, I can't, man. I got to go home. You know, it's really, I'm, I don't want to defy you but i really need to go home i go well why don't you send my wife and son up and he goes oh that's impossible that's just impossible he says it's too much liability i said okay then i'm going home i'm really sorry you know so that night i called my wife and she says hey i talked to phil he said he said we're flying up <laughs> <laughs> so i was pretty stoked so i still can see joanne getting off the airplane on the gravel runway there in, in dutch harbor with a six-month-old baby on her back, his, arm, his arms out. He was ready for Alaska, that kid. Mm -hmm. So that summer, we crossed the Bering Sea, crossed the North, sea, North Pacific, and went up and down the inside about three or four times. And Gus was on it the whole time. Now, what, were, what was your job on the boat at this time? Still I was an engineer. I started out the first year as a deckhand and became an engineer shortly after that. One of those classic moments. This is how you get jobs, okay? This is how I got the skipper's job, too. I'm down taking some gear apart in the engine room that I've never taken apart. It was a centrifuge filter. The engineer walks down in his airport clothes, because we always dress different to go to the airport. He goes, the bank's taking my house away and my wife's leaving me, so I know you'll do a good job. See you later. I suddenly became an engineer. And I'm going, wait a minute, how do I put this thing back together? <laughs> you, know? you took it apart. I didn't know. I didn't know. I knew a very, you know, I knew some. And I was determined to learn because engineers are a good slot. So I engineered for seven years. Anyway, after this big summer with Gus and, and Joanne, and uh, we had a really fun summer going up and down the inside. We were actually hauling pink salmon from southeast Alaska to Bellingham, if you could believe that. That was a in, up and down the inside. Then we converted the boat. The boat went into shipyard, and then it starts getting fun, or funny. So the big Pollock JV thing was on. Everybody was going JVing. King Crab crashed, 
the boats were choking their guys were losing their boats I mean it was it was a mess so they got they got Marco through a couple of different ways to agree to convert this boat to a trawler for cost because they wanted to get one out there because the RAP was doing all the conversions and they were doing a really good job we uh, pulled in and they ripped the boat apart plumbed it for hydraulics put the winches on did all that stuff and we also had to hire some guys because I didn't know anything and we had another guy on there Dan Clark who was the cook he didn't know anything and then we we hired Bart Campbell I don't know if you know Bart but Bart Campbell used to work with Chuck he's been around forever he's a really smart guy really good guy Bart went to whitefish school in England so he could learn how to trawl <laughs> and we hired Jim McManus because he said he'd been trawling and then we hired a Portuguese guy named Tony Tanea he was our web guy so, I mean, we were definitely the gang that couldn't shoot straight. We didn't know <laughs> squat. I am amazed we survived. It was like we took off for Shelikov Strait and got up there, and Marco did a horrible job on the conversion. Just horrible. Nothing worked. Nothing worked. I was the engineer, and I was on the single sideband radio on KMI for a buck and a half or dollar twenty-five a minute trying to figure this thing out and there was a computer about the size of this table which is quite big underneath the wheelhouse it was probably no powerful than a flip phone you know yeah trying to get this thing to trawl trying to get it to trawl i about lost my mind i mean i could not lay down without alarms going off hydraulics blowing but it was just gone on and on and on and on long story short we jv for nine months that year you, yeah. now describe jv jv is a where back in the old days there was no limits on what the foreigners could do in Alaskan waters. So the foreigners fished in the Bering Sea, and they knew the Bering Sea really well, and Shelikov and all these really rich fishing grounds. Then the Magnuson Act came in, I believe it was, and it went into the 200-mile limit. And the foreigners said, hey, you guys aren't catching this fish. Why don't you give us permits to fish in here, you know? And that was right about the time they said, no, we're going to Americanize our fleet, so we'll catch the fish and deliver it to you, to the foreigners, because you have the processors. So a whole new fleet grew up around us. Many, many of the crab boats converted over to trawlers, including the Columbia, and we would deliver 40, 50 ton bags to these big factory trawlers, Japanese, Koreans, Polish, Russians, Chinese, you name it. They look like a city out there. So Pollock? Boat, yeah, Pollock. Some boats were doing really good on really good gross stocks delivering to the foreigners. They also did yellowfin sole, they did codfish, they did all kinds of stuff. And the Portuguese were the only guys that knew how to fix a net. I mean, literally, the American guys didn't know how to fix a net. And so they're trying to teach us, you know. <laughs> there are some pretty funny times where we would, we were just, we, we didn't know what we were doing. We got a net hung up on our front net reel. Because it, it it got a, it ripped apart and then it got put up on the net rail and we couldn't get it off. We tried and tried and tried and tried. We could not get it off. Finally, we just put a tarp over it and, and fished the whole rest of the season without that reel because we couldn't get the net off. Right. And you know, some guy that knew what he was doing came right down and took the net off. So it was pretty funny. In fact, Jim McManus got a, a poster of himself fixing our gear from that. So after the JV days, at the end of that J, first JV season. We had to come back to the yard again to rip the boat apart again, and I just couldn't handle. I just couldn't. I couldn't face it. I, I I didn't have the. It was depressing thinking about what we had to do, and I just made thirty thousand dollars in nine months, and I was away from my family, my wife and young son then that long. So I said, you know, I'm just going to quit. I got to find. I got to do something else. This isn't working. So that's probably one of the worst decisions I ever made in my life because they got the boat fixed. They went up and they. Banked them. They they knocked the crap out of them for a couple of years. They had huge seasons, and uh, that boat I don't think ever made more money than than at, at that time. It didn't feel right being at home, you know. As a carpenter, then the carpenters like to do concrete, and I hated it. I hated going to work. I didn't like it. I like I like being on the water. So I came back in '87 as the engineer. As soon as I called Bart, he says, I was wondering when you are going to call. So here I am back on the same boat again. I had called Chris. Bart Eaton. Bart, Bart Campbell. Oh, Bart Campbell. Okay. Yeah, believe it or not. And they're, they're the same age, same era. So I'll tell you all about them later. I did get a call from Chris Paulson to go to work on the North Sea. 
And I wanted to do it in a worse way because they're first class operation, but I had the flu. And I had the flu for like 10 days and he finally called me and said, I, got, I can't wait, I gotta get a guy. And I wonder how my life would have been different if I would have worked over crabbing in 87 instead of going trawling. But anyway, I came back as an engineer and at the end of that summer, Bart was unhappy and he walked up to me and he said, uh, this is pretty funny. He walked to me, he said, uh, well, I don't know if I got fired or if I quit, but I'm not driving the boat anymore. So if you want to drive this boat, you better go up and call Kari Ness. I went, oh, okay. You know, I was down there with my greasy pants on and everything else. So I went running upstairs and I called Kari and you knew Kari, didn't you? Yeah. Oh man, it's just nobody better. I mean, he's just an ambassador for, he's just a wonderful guy. Anyway, I called him up and he says, yeah, I don't know what's wrong with Bart, but, uh, anyway, he says, uh, do you feel like you're ready? And I said, yeah. He goes, well, okay, you go ahead and take her out. We'll see how you do. <laughs> yeah. Are you ready? Yeah. So have you shirt before? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Sure, yeah. I, I can kind of pulled the you phone bet. away and looked at it. Did he just give me a $10 million boat? Yeah, let's go see how you do. You know, I said, holy crap. What a, what a great moment. Oh, it was it was too funny. Every, every captain I talked to, it, when they first get that set of keys the oh, first you time, do. man, uh, how'd you feel? What's, God. Well, you go down to the boat. There was another guy on the boat that thought he should have got the job, so he was pissed, you know, and I took him aside and I said, look, I'm going to start rotating on here. If, if you want to hang in there, we'll rotate together, you know, but I said, just yeah, let me get, let me get the boat, let's yeah. get going on this thing. Because, <laughs> quite honestly, I wasn't sure how to even set a net. <laughs> <laughs> it was bad. It was so bad. You think you're ready for it? Oh, yeah, I'm yeah. ready for it. I remember scraping down the dock because I didn't know how to use the spring line, you know. It was just like, God, Jack. But I was totally determined to do it, you know. So so, so then uh, once you took over, obviously you, you spent the remainder of your captain. Well, you've done other things, too, but the Columbia had your heart for all those years. Well, from 87 until 2013. Yeah. yeah, and I don't know how many years that is. It's, it's not 30 years, but it's a lot of years. And I saw a tremendous amount of changes. Now, when I started on the Columbia trawling for Pollock at Trident, shore-based, there was three boats. There was the Viking Explorer, the Pacific Viking, and the Columbia. And they took one boat a day. That was their delivery schedule. And we couldn't fill our boats up. The Columbia has three tanks. They only wanted two tanks. So the guy that ran the show back then he always said no only two tanks only two tanks okay yeah sure Clyde no problem two tanks so and that was kind of like you didn't even need to call because when you left the dock you knew you'd be back in two days with how much you ever caught you know it was it was so different because we used bottom nets during the day we had to switch doors in the morning roll out the bottom net fish bottom nets our electronics was a wireless horrible picture trying to figure out we, we really didn't know what our nets were doing the midwater nets were so tiny, and our Pollock bag was about 40 tons. Small. 40 tons. And if that boat holds 250 tons, it was like six or seven toes. If we're lucky, six or seven toes to fill the boat up. It was a lot of work, man. Plus, of course, the computer didn't work right, and the doors would get crossed, and oh, we were hanging up. Every, nobody knew where the snags were, and it was just... You know, I'm really glad I was young back then, because the learning curve was really steep. It was like... You had to bang around a lot and bash around and kind of bump up against things and figure out what the tides were doing. We didn't know anything. I mean, the whole fleet didn't know anything. We were we were just learning it. When we did convert it to a shore base, well, let me, let me jump around here. Corey and Chuck, Trident bought the Columbia, so it became part of the Trident fleet. And they also bought the A-boats, Arcturus and the Earl Devon. And they brought an entirely new culture in when they brought those two boats in. These guys are from Anacortes, and you know those guys. I mean, they're like, they are in their own world, kind of like the Pulses are in their own. They do their own thing, you know, which is really cool. But the more I talked to the one of the drivers, um, Gene, Gino, I realized his net was like twice as big as mine, and he's towing a 125-ton cod end. And I'm going... I'm hearing net envy. Wait a minute. <laughs> Wait a... 120... You, you're making this in two toes? He goes, oh, yeah, you don't want to make any more toes than that. That takes too long, you know, because it takes an hour to dump a bag, whether it's big or little. Yeah. I mean, so he really opened my eyes. His net was 35 fathoms wide, and for those of you who know that, you're going to laugh, but mine was 25 fathoms wide, and it was like I had the little, I was swinging the little dinger, you know. So mm -hmm. anyway, we went down and got converted, or excuse me, 
Yes, we did. We went down to get converted to a shore based trawler, which was different than a JV trawler. JV trawlers didn't require the stability of a, of a shore based trawler. Shore base, you drag, you know, you drag up these big bags and you've got 40, 50 tons on deck. You better have some stability. I mean, you got to know, you got to be about yourself, and the boat's got to have it built in, it's got to have reserve stability. And so they did all this. Marco did the, the conversion with what we call shelter decks and an A-frame and an alleyway and all these things to contain the fish and uh, better piping and we did a first class job on that. And I was on the owner, or excuse me, the designer. I was on his case, Bruce Whittemore. I knocked on his door almost every day. Bruce, what about this? Bruce, what about that? What about the stability? What about, where do I keep the fuel? Where do I keep the fresh water? What am I gonna do with this? Where is that? He finally told somebody, you think Jack's okay? He sure asked a lot of questions. You know, <laughs> I wanted to totally understand. I want to understand this boat's stability, when I could push it, when I couldn't push it. I think it really paid off because I was able to to push some things in that once we got that boat out there, it was a killer machine. So, so when I went out to sea to fish, I knew two boats, Norman and, and Jeff on the Viking Explorer and the Pacific Viking and, and PV John, we call them. But I did know Jim McManus, because I'd worked with him, right? Mm -hmm. Well, he was on the Storm Petrel at the time. And I'm out there looking for Jim McManus so I could talk to somebody, you know? I want to meet, because I'm just an engineer from Akatan. And when you, when you fish out of Akatan, you're pretty much isolated from Dutch. You don't really mix with the guys. You don't, you know, you're not going to the bars. And you're not, you're not around anybody unless you'd fished with him somewhere else. So when Jim said he's getting ready to leave, because he's very helpful, you know, helping me on the currents and where the fish were and all that, he goes, yeah, this guy, I'm rotating two months on, two months off. I'm taking off, so Lloyd's going to show up. And I'm going, oh, crap, I don't know anybody. I don't know Lloyd, you know, blah, blah, blah. And Lloyd came along, and he just couldn't have been nicer. He was like, he was like a godsend to me. He introduced me to the fleet. I fed those guys fish information, and I became part of the bigger fleet, you know, where they would work with me and I'd work with them, and it was... It was a great thing. Now, which um, Lloyd are you talking about? Lloyd Johansson. And you're going to be interviewing him, and he's a real treat. He uh, He's from the old school, the Corey Nuss school. His, his dad was... You, you'll see. He'll, he'll tell you about that. I don't get too much into that. One of the best things I did of all my career was I brought my son up when he's eight years old. Jim McManus had just become the manager, and I asked Jim, I said, hey, Jim, I need to take my son to Alaska. He's getting a little too much influence from his mom and sisters he goes oh there's no way sorry man yeah i mean they used to do that in the old days but there's just too too much liability and i said well do you mind if i ask chuck you know i don't want to go around you and he goes no that's fine go ahead and ask him you know so i called and of course diane answered and she goes oh yeah I'll put you through to chuck and you know it's always been the greatest thing about that company is you can just get through to the people right at the top chuck says oh what's going on you know and i said well my son's eight years old chuck and i, I think he needs to be around men more he's uh you know, he's hanging out with his wife and sisters and my mom, his mom and sisters. And uh, what would you think if he came up with me this summer? And he goes, by God, I think that's a good idea. I said, really? He goes, well, yeah. He says, I did that with my kids. I, I said, oh, I, great. I, I think you need to expand on that. Uh, <laughs> he was spending too much time because I read your book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I don't want to embarrass guests. <laughs> <laughs> he was uh, calling his, his uh, weighty tighties his panties. And that was about all I needed to hear. <laughs> I looked at his mom and said, he needs to go to Alaska. We don't wear panties in Alaska, right? So when Chuck just floored me, classic Chuck, he went right to the core. And he and I said, Chuck, what about the attorneys, you know? He goes, well, let me tell you. He said, sometimes you just got to tell these attorneys who they work for. He goes, we'll get it figured out. He says, you just promised me he's going to be safe, you know? And, you know, when he graduated from high school... He got a really, Gus got a really nice letter from his counselor that said he could see the influence Alaska had on Gus's life. And I sent that to Chuck and he, him, Diane, and I just thanked him. I said, thank you for letting me. I took him every single year after that. He is now 34 years old. He's been in the Bering Sea since he was eight. He's every up, he's single up there year. right now. He's up there right now, poking around, yeah, in Kodiak. So it's Problem. had a, it's obviously it's had a great influence on Gus because he's an outstanding young man, but clearly it's had a big influence on you too. Oh yeah, it was you know him and I got along great. Some captains can't get along with their kids. In fact, I saw quite a few captains bring up their kids, and the kids didn't like it. They just didn't want to be there, and I understand. But Gus is you know he's half Swedish and he's he's just 
he's a natural he's just a he's just a darn natural around the water and around boats and super curious and, and uh it wasn't long before he's sitting on the counter telling me what her turn or who to talk to on the radio or you know all that stuff he's just a little 10 year old guy yeah, so. he's, he's sharp so yeah. where are you at now jack and where where do you see yourself going forward well that's a fun one um yeah, the changes have been amazing. Uh, in the years, the years that I did this, the, the nets, the electronics, the way we offloaded, the way we scheduled things, this is, it just became so slick. It became so, I mean, we just kicked ass. And like Craig, our good friend Craig says, we just make it look too easy. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't that sound like him? Yeah. You know? And I learned if you do something well, you can make it look easy. And we were doing a difficult thing. Howard and I have talked about this before. I said, do you realize what we just did the last 24 hours? And we're going to go to the dock and everybody's going to shrug their shoulders like, no big deal, you know. So so anyway, in 2013, I'll catch everybody up. I went to the Arctic on the Norseman 2. It's something I'd been wanting to do. I'd, I'd moonlighted a few trips as a mate. And then they said, yeah, they would let me take the boat up into the ice, which is actually quite a compliment because if you're a Russian or a Canadian ice captain, you have to be a mate for 12 years before they let you drive a boat in the ice. And I drove that up there. We took it all the way up above the Arctic Circle, above Barrow. It is a trip. It's totally different than the Bering Sea. In fact, you're a thousand miles away from Dutch Harbor when you're up above the Arctic Circle. We ended up getting 400 miles above the Arctic Circle. We had 30 people on board. My wife and daughter were on board. They were feeding 30 people uh, four meals a day. They worked a lot harder than I did as far as physical work goes. I didn't sleep much because the ice is constantly moving. It never stops moving, and it changes direction. And it's probably the most inhospitable, in fact it is, easily, the most inhospitable coastline I've ever sailed because for three or 400 miles, it's all shoals, shallow spots, and it's uncharted. And if the ice starts to come down on you, you got nowhere to go. You can't, you can't keep, keep getting shallower, and there is nowhere to hide. There's not a point or a cove or a bay anywhere. It was... Uh, pretty exciting so I got off of there and I drove the Cornelia Marie for a summer Joanne came with me that was fun being on a famous boat I could probably write a whole nother book about that I really appreciated Casey and and the owners um, let me take the boat up they just got out of the yard it was a good summer and then I switched to the Aleutian Ballad believe it or not and I bet you don't know what that is that's a tour boat a former deadliest catch boat that got converted to a tour boat out of Ketchikan and they haul up to 130 people twice a day, take them out into this certain bay they have staked out and show people how we fish crab and tell them your story. And it was from there that I learned about public speaking and because the owner, David Luthien, he's a really smart guy, I said, hey, what do you want? What kind of script do we have here? What do you want me to talk about to these people? He goes, hey, just tell them your story. I said, what do you mean, tell them my story? He goes, you'll figure it out. Just tell them your story. Fishermen all have stories. and They want to hear about your life, you know. What boats you've been on? Uh, did you fall in the water? Have you been, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so it really came down to that. And then they asked me if I would go on the Princess Cruise Line to speak to the people for an hour. So I, I'm doing that now. I fly up to Seattle from Bend. I get on a cruise ship. I, I ride it up to Ketchikan. And on the way up, I do a one-hour presentation. In the last four or five years of my career fishing, I, I took a lot of photos, uh, a lot of photos. And so I used those in the presentation and explained to people what the fishing life's been like, and here's the ice, and here's the eagles, and you know, blah, 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 this is with the illusions. And it's really well received. People love it. Um, the cruise ships really like to get like the dog sledders, you know, the Alaska people, that sort of thing. So it's kind of an Alaskan experience for people. And then I get off and fly home. And from that, I ended up writing a book, my first one, because uh, I wanted to get something out there. I had a bunch of thing, ideas in mind, and I guess I'm just increasing my digital footprint, you might call it. In fact, this might help. You're, uh, you're, you're working on your second book now. I am. I wrote this second book. I wrote it first, and for, for various reasons, my editor said, you'll never finish this before you leave on your trip. We went on a 90-day trip last fall around the country. We did all 48 states. She goes, why don't you write a short 100-page book, kick that out, and we did, all by her recommendation. And it was really good practice for me because writing is like any other skill. If you gotta, you got to practice it, and, and I enjoy doing it. I, I do enjoy the writing, and I actually enjoy the public speaking. I like, 
I like seeing people get fascinated by stuff they've never been exposed to. In fact, I even tell them, hey, I'm going to show you things you've never seen. You're going to hear things you've never heard. Now, in this day and age of the Internet, where can you do that? Right. Right? And it's happening right here in the stern of your boat. I mean, it's just it's so wonderful that you've tapped into these guys because these this enormous swirl of life and experiences going on around here, and you're just like reaching out and grabbing them, you know. So I'm trying to. Oh, you're doing a great. So we're running out of time here, but I, I really right. want to know what advice you'd have for young guys trying to get in. I know your son, six months old, he was on a boat. Yeah. You know, eight years old, he started, you know, helping you carry out trash and still on the boat and yeah. that kind of things. But some guys don't have that opportunity. They're like you were back when you were coming up to Seattle, walking those docks and going back home, walking the docks, going back home, walking the docks, not getting those jobs. What's your advice for those young guys really trying to... It's really, uh, I think it's really important to be young. I've had 30-year-old, 35-year-old guys with a wife and two kids. You know, they're the checkered Safeway, and they know me, and they go, Jack, take me fishing, man. I hate my job. Take me fishing. And it's like, I took a carpenter that was 30 years old. He's super smart. Every skill he had was worthless on the boat. He had to start all over. I mean, you're not using hammers and nails. you got a rope or a twine, or a needle, and, you know, your place is jumping around, and when you're 30 or 35 years old, you have settled into a certain amount of skills that you've gained, and they're good skills, they're marketable skills, they don't work on a boat, it's just baffling, because I tell people, you don't eat the same, you don't sleep the same, you don't think the same, you don't communicate with your home the same, you don't do anything the same, so you got to really be adaptable, and when you're 18 or 20, or 22, you can be adaptable. I mean, you're still moldable, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And it's not anything you consciously do wrong. It's just that you've already got those years if you're older like that. So I would. there is work out there. There's plenty of work out there. And I'll tell you why. I've talked to a lot of different industries. Oil drillers, mining, ranching, logging, fishing. They're all productive industries. And they're all hurting for young guys. Because most of the young guys, and they'll tell you, most of the young guys just want to be on their phone and do a startup company and there's nothing wrong with that but there's also nothing wrong with working with your hands it's very satisfying it's really really cool to go out and do what i used to call extract protein from a hostile environment you do it without fanfare you don't have anybody screaming and yelling you just pull you just pull protein out of the ocean and it's it's totally renewable it's really cool well jack i can't thank you enough for coming and talking with us today and sharing your story and helping me launch this first episode. Oh yeah! Uh, again, I just uh, I can't thank you enough. Well, you got a great you got a great resource here. I, I got great. Whole, I I know it's going to go because it's uh, fascinating stuff. It's stuff it's stuff that you don't hear. That's the whole idea of it is to get some of these stories before they're gone. You've passed some of yours down to Gus, and he'll have those. Oh yeah. You know, but some of these other guys that we've uh, we've already interviewed. Those stories are not going to be recaptured again, you know, not? unless we get them down. All right, guys, this has been Galley Stories, Stories of the Bering Sea and Beyond, and we'll see you next time.